this is Jackie Lukeman. And I'm on the side here as Abdul Shahid Lukeman. Here, we wanted to start a new discussion today. Yes. Because, um, mm -hmm. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, because we, I mean, we've been looking at so much stuff. We are huge fans of The Wire, so we, we've been kind of binging on The Wire and watched this other British series called, what was it, Top Boy? Top about Boy. About the, like, the drug trade in, in the UK. And, hi, Sylvia. And um, looking at, at the, the thing, the stuff that's going on with immigration um, and uh, all of the, the stuff that, that's, that the crazy stuff that, that Trump is coming out of his mouth with and look, thinking about Obama's legacy and all that kind of stuff. So we were just throwing a bunch of topics around today and we kind of thought like just in general, how is it? That, that black people are still struggling. Now, we've had eight years of Obama, right? And that was supposed to have been so much better for us. And, you know, this was after uh, the Civil Rights Act, right? You know, and, and Obama being elected president was supposed to be the culmination of, you know, the realization of Martin Luther King's dream. I see you, Christopher. How you doing? Um, so, 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 how, so we were just kind of thinking, it as we were watching The Wire, actually, it was really funny, like, how is it through all of these years of American industrialism and, you know, we're looking at the port season of the wire and seeing the, the rise and then the decline of the American working class and the middle class. How is it that black people are still kind of on the bottom of the barrel economically in this country? And we thought of this just general broad um, idea that. A rising tide does not lift all bo all boats. Not not when it comes to us. So there's a lot in that. I mean, a lot in that. But we wanted to start that discussion today. Yeah. So what what we what we really want to do is is have you guys because this we you know get your coffee, uh -uh. your donuts, uh -huh. whatever you want to snack on, um, you know, and 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 we're giving you time to do to do that. And, you know, sit down with us and we welcome you and we thank you for joining us on this Sunday afternoon. And um, we're going to have what we believe um, uh, is going to be an interesting discussion for the next hour. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and um, as a reminder, uh, please go to our Coffee Current Events page. If you haven't already, like the page on Facebook, mm -hmm. like it. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Luke Ryan Nation. Mm -hmm. Please subscribe. Um, follow us on Twitter. Mm -hmm. All of the social media thing. You guys know the drill. So, you know, yep. um, and we welcome your support. We love your support. Yes. And we love, yeah. I mean, really, guys, we're not just saying this, um, you know, to blow smoke up anybody's uh, behind. We really do love um, the support that you guys give us, and and this and that's what keeps us going. Yeah, yeah. So, so we were listening to Yvette Carnell earlier today after you know binging on on all kinds of social commentary this weekend, watching The Wire, watching Top Boy, watching RT, and all kinds of stuff, and just got our heads all full of you know why why are first of all one well, the, the the big question was why are black people so susceptible to like these desperate ponzi scheme type of you know everybody pushing a quick buck kind of way for for black people who are economically and socially and politically disenfranchised to get rich why why are we so so susceptible to to that and then that led to um, this further bigger discussion that, that we want to have about why this idea of a rising tide lifts all boats um, is BS. No, well, we have to remember where that phrase comes from. Okay, right. Where does that phrase uh, come well, from? Well, this was the phrase that um, uh, President Barack Obama, former President Barack Obama, mm -hmm. um, when discussing his economic policy, um, when he was asked about his economic policy for specifically for the black community. Mm -hmm. And his response was that um, we would do better because his policies would rot what, what he called rise the tides of everyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so mm -hmm. um, that will lift all boats, including the, uh, um, you know, the boat that, um, uh, uh, you know, USS black America, <laughs> USS. you know, so right, 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 right. <laughs> 
So you know, you know that that boat that's been grounded for so long. Well, the one that's that's my, that's that's that stuck ride, in the reef. Right, the one that's that you know the corals and grew around it. Uh huh. Right, and, right. And um, no matter how much we try to get towed out of it and all this other kind of stuff by previous administrations, mm -hmm. um, that tide seems to not go that far inland. Right. You know to lift our boat up. You know, right. So. And, and and let's be honest and let's be fair. President Obama was the only person who used that phrase. Bernie Sanders also used that phrase yeah. on the campaign trail. And uh, thanks, Sandy. And, 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 and hey again, Chris. And Bernie Sanders used that, that on the campaign trail. And w black people rightfully nailed him for that. We, we rightfully said, hey, whoa, whoa no, no. Uh, uh, generally, just focusing on economic policies uh, uh, doesn't, isn't going to fix racial inequality. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 crazy though how we we hopped on Bernie Sanders for saying that, but we didn't say anything to President Obama about about saying that, and that is a part of this discussion. Well, I wanted to uh, comment with um, uh, Christopher McMillan. Um, he, you know, which he's, he's right. Uh -huh, the uh -huh. phrase does go back to Gordon Gecko, but we're talk, uh, but we're we're talking about it in the context of how it relates to a specific question that was given to Barack Obama in the context of the economic situation of the black community, which I don't think Gordon Gecko was talking about. <laughs> yeah, Gordon, yeah, Gordon but, wasn't talking about Yeah, so we, I mean, you know, we admit that Barack Obama didn't invent the phrase, but... Right, you know, right. So I just want, you know, just want to be clear on that point. Right, so, so when, when, when black people had such an issue with Bernie Sanders saying, you know, look, a rising tide lifts all boats, or, you know, if we just fix economic inequality, we're going to solve the problems, many of the problems of racism in America. The reason so many black people had such an issue with that is because that's bull. I, I mean, that, that's just, just garbage on its face because it doesn't recognize the separate impact uh, that, that racism plays that, that worsens economic inequality for us. Right. Right. So, yes, there is economic inequality in this country in general. Um, and there always has been. There have always been, like you say all the time, the planter class and and the working class, right. the planter class and the and the and the harvesters. Um, when we're going to go back to the agrarian society that the that that the United States started as you had the wealthy land and farm owners who hired out before slavery, who, who hired out workers to plant and harvest their crops, right? The people who had the power were always the people who had who owned the land, who bought the crops, who paid the wages of the people who did the actual hard labor, you know, farming, right? The landowners, they didn't get out there usually, they didn't get out there behind the horse and the plow and help farm. They they Usually, they actually didn't even direct. They hired somebody else to do that. They're called overseers. They're middle management, right? So, we've always had inequality, a wealth inequality, income inequality in this country to the point where there were always a very few, a very small percentage of people who possessed a lot of wealth and land and then everybody else had to work their behinds off to get a little bit of something to survive. Now, that wasn't always a bad thing. And actually, I think that's kind of true in every society that exists, mm. almost. Almost every society that exists that relies upon the, the profit for personal gain model to feed the economy of, of their society, right? Because when you look at let's say, indigenous societies uh, that do not have a, a, a for-profit component, they don't have this level of inequality. There is a hierarchy, right? But in general, you don't have, like, wealthy indigenous people who have all of the land and they're telling everybody else in the tribe, this is what you have to do, and they're profiting off of the labor of everybody else in the tribe. That usually doesn't happen in in societies where profit is not a component of the economy right. that undergirds the society. Um, and that, that's, that's my um, um, 
10,000 foot uh, introduction to ec college economics understanding of, <laughs> of, the, of the world, yeah, it's right? Not, it's not an MMT discussion. It's, right? not, it's not an yeah. MMT <laughs> discussion, and dear God, it's not going to be one. Because <laughs> um, I don't entirely understand all of that. But here's the thing. Um, when, when, we, when we moved this economy toward, away from more of uh, an agrarian type of um, you, you earn what you work for type of, and correct me if I'm wrong, right? Mm. That everybody has an opportunity to earn as much as they can for whatever they want. You might not get as much as the landowner. As a matter of fact, it's guaranteed you're not going to get as much as the landowner. But if you as a planter want to, um, what do they call it? Uh, um, um, uh, um, Put yourself out there if you as a, a planter or a sower or a harvester want to um, uh, really extend the extra effort, then you you reap the rewards of your effort, right? That That's the way we have been told this society is, that's the way we've been told this society is in America. Here's the problem. That's not how this society is. Mm -hmm. This American society has not been this type of egalitarian. Is that the right word, or is that or, or um, a fair, fair uh, profit for for production kind of? We've never been that kind of society, because the people who own the means of production have always made it impossible for those of us who do the actual production to reap any more benefits from our production than what they want. That's been true in general. Mm. Why? Because they're greedy. There's no science. You you don't need a degree to understand greed. Right. I mean, yeah, we're talking about basically exploitation exactly. of, of, of the working class. And, and, and one of the best examples of how bad it was in, in, in America as far as uh, industrial greed or the greed of the industrial class, the greed of the business owner happened during, who was it, FDR's uh, administration? Uh, yeah, probably, um, yeah, about, yeah, we're talking about, around about FDR's administration. Right, where he, he, he went to the industrialists and told them, this was FDR, right? I believe so, yeah. He went to the industrialists and told them, if you don't pay workers their fair share, if you don't release some of the wealth that you are hoarding, and keeping from the people who are making you the money, they are going to come after you with pitchforks, and guess what? I can't stop them. And what happened? Well, I mean, yeah, and, and just to put that in context, um, the American, uh, you know, it was during the time when, like we seen during the uh, last recession, and you had, you know, all this capital that's just being sat upon. It wasn't being um, uh, invested mm -hmm. into the society. It wasn't being used for, um, you know, to... Uh, uh, help uh, propel the society mm -hmm. out of the depression, and, and uh, they were just sitting on capital. Right. And right. Um, so then you have all this mass unemployment, you have mm -hmm. all this other stuff going on, mm -hmm. and at the same time, you're uh, you're also starting to see the rise of political movements such as the Communist Party. Right. Uh, Americans were looking at alternatives. Mm -hmm. They were looking at communism. They were looking at socialism. They were looking at other means because they were like, hey, look, you know, um, what we got right now is not working. So, um, you know, so the, the, the you know the poor working class. And um, as, as um, uh, those of us who um, study that part of, of our history realize that even in the African American community, the communists were very strong. I mean, we know we had people like Paul Robeson and and uh, W. E. B. Du Bois and, uh, that was that was starting to advocate mm -hmm. socialist po policy. Right. They were starting right. to promote socialist policy, and communism. So you started to see a rise in membership of mm -hmm. these things. And now, remind you now, this was maybe like 20 years after the Bolshevik Revolution right. that, happened, that took place in Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so what happened is, is that FDR said, look, you know, you seen what, what happened over there. You know, you see, you know, you've seen the fate over there. Right. Now, right. Um, we can either continue to, um, you guys can continue to do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and what's going to happen is. We're gonna have that over here, right? You know, right? And so, if we don't, if you don't want that, then I suggest that you, you know, get up off of some of that get money. Get off the, get yeah, up off that's the funds. That's sitting on. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem of it is, is that we didn't have during this past recession, 
that happened under um, but started with Bush and then with Obama, mm -hmm. we didn't have that type of leadership. Right. Speak to the money people that way. Exactly. And and that happened. Then what year was that? Uh, maybe like in the early, like in the thirties or something like that. Yeah. So so we're talking about this period of 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 unchecked uh, wealth growing among the one percent. That's not new in America. It's happened before. The difference is like. Abda said, when it happened then, we had leadership that stopped it. We didn't have that this time. Okay, so, so I gave you the, the 10,000 foot overview of income inequality and wealth inequality in this country real quick that applies to everybody, everybody, black, white, everybody, everybody who's not a, a rich land-owning corporation CEO or board, board of trustee member, right? So you've got that truth over here, all right? Let's put that truth over here. So then you add the component of race, and, and we can have the discussion about race is not real. It's a, it's a social construct. That's all very true, but it is still the social construct upon which an entire group of people were locked out of the American economy altogether. Right? Because, so let's go back to that, that agrarian model. Let's go back to the landowner um, who had crops to plant and they needed to hire a workforce to help plant all the, well, what if you don't want to pay people? And, and it's, it's true <clears throat> that slavery did not always exist in the United States um, as, as, as a racially focused institution, but at some point, it did become an institution that was focused specifically and maintained uh, 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 only for the enslavement of black people. And that free labor for two and a half centuries, about 10 generations. Now, we're talking about... <laughs> we're talking about we already have a society where we've got a small percentage of people who own the land, own the means of production, control wages. That's for everybody. Then you've got this other group of people um, who were brought here for the specific and expressed purpose of being the free labor force to produce wealth for that group of landowners. And they were especially um, uh, uh, um, beneficial to that group of, of, of land and wealth owners, that small percentage of people who owned the means of production because they didn't have to pay them wages. All they had to do was keep them alive, like livestock, which is what slaves were considered. So, um, so you had poor white people, so you had landowners, people who owned the means of production, people who, who uh, controlled politics and policy, who were also the people who owned the means of production at the time, by the way. Also wealthy landowners. Then you had um, skilled white labor, right? Middle management. Mm -hmm. the, the, you had skilled white labor who the wealthy landowners could call on to oversee or manage their land, their farming, their, their slave operations. Then you had poor white people who could be employed by middle management to help them do their job. And at the very bottom of that hierarchy, you've got the unpaid forced labor force of black slaves who for two and a half centuries didn't receive a dime in compensation. Now, so now we started off this conversation with um, uh, uh, economic inequality. Right. So one of the things that we have to ask ourselves for all of us who are um, trying to figure out why our society is the way it is, mm -hmm. one of the things that we have to ask ourselves, and, and especially as black people, but as a society, we need to ask ourselves, why are black people poor? Why, why are black people... If you go to the data... And you, and you look at the data, and, and as, as we always are told, 
The data shows us how we live. Mm -hmm. The data shows what type of society that we have. Right. So when we look at the data, we see that black people are at the bottom of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so, so we have to ask ourselves that through the great society, through, mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's, mm -hmm. let's start with the, um, um, with, with, and Christopher uh, McMillan rem uh, reminded me of, 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 of something, that part of the agreement with FDR was the fact that blacks were excluded from the unions. That Social Security did not include oh. farm workers. Right. That the farm and domestic Right, right. Farm, farm and domestic workers. Mm -hmm. That the reason why people who work in certain service industries who earn tips can get paid below the minimum wage because at that time um, it was um, most, it was, um, those, those jobs were mostly um, held by black people. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened was it was determined that, um, that the minimum wage didn't apply to them. Right. You know, so right. so you know, so when we talk about race, so we have to ask ourselves, why is it that black people are so poor? So we started off this conversation with this rise in time. Look, not only did, did we hear about uh, Obama with the with, with this lame excuse of Bernie Sanders with this lame excuse that a rise in time will lift everybody up, mm -hmm. we go back to Reagan who said that trickle down economics <laughs> was supposed to um, uh, help everybody. Right. There was right. there was never. Um, and, and, and I can uh, say this, that there was never any major effort on the United States government's part to, um, um, to address the uh, systemic poverty of, 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 of the descendants of slaves. Right. So we're, we're in this position now because we talk about that one of the great equal, uh, the, the reason why the things are so unequal economically is because we're descendants of slaves. You just mentioned it, Jackie, that you had four million people in this country who did not receive pay for work that they've done. Right now, okay. Let's let's because see, this is going to be a very long. This discussion is not gonna. We're not gonna finish this today, right? This is gonna be a long freaking discussion. We this we might be talking about this for months um, because there is so much that goes into this and. Um, oh, Christopher just typed, sung Young Buck, and it just reminded me of the duck in the other. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, something you said uh, uh, sparked something in my mind. You said that for years, blacks were excluded from the unions. We were just having this conversation when we were watching The Wire. One of our favorite... Which still happens, by the way. Which still happens. One of our favorite seasons, and I know we're kind of all over the place, y'all, but this, there, there, is, there is no other way for us to have this conversation and, and feel like we're doing it any justice unless we just dive right into it and, and start doing it. Because it, it includes everything and it impacts everything. And, and we intend to show you that. We're not just going to sit here and talk about how the white man screwed black men over. Uh, how you know how the white man screwed black you know screwed black people over? No, we're going to explain to you why this idea that a rising tide doesn't lift all boats. And Razzie uh, Metcalf asks, "How about women?" All right, let me put put the remind me of the union thing. Remind me not to forget that because I do want to address your comment, Razzie. Even as white men um, were allowed. Um, power and rights that even white women were not allowed to have, black men and black women were not allowed to have the rights that white women were have for, uh, did have for centuries. Um, so there is, there is absolutely the truth of white male patriarchy where um, women have been oppressed. It is also true that black men and black women have had our rights denied for even longer than white women have. So white women have seen gains in American society where black men and black women were still locked out. And one example of that is affirmative action. Um, for a very long time, people like to throw affirmative action up in black people's faces like, oh, well, you got affirmative action now, so why are you still complaining about racism? Well, the thing about affirmative action is, and the law was not written this way, it is how people in power have used it. White women have actually benefited more from affirmative action than most black people have. Um, because 
when you say, when, you, when business people claim they're filling a position based on affirmative action uh, rules, they'll say, well, I can fill this position with a woman because I've filled two categories under the affirmative action law. I fill the woman category and I fill the minority category because women are considered a minority class under the law. Even so, though they're more than half the population. Even though, even though all women are more than half the population and because there is still systemic racism in employment, nine and a half times out of ten, the woman that the that employers the women that employers choose to fill those positions are white women. Well let's let's talk about this argument about what about women. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, uh, Razzy, um, for, uh, forgive me if I'm if I'm you know taking this out of context. But when we hear, and, and this this is not directed to you personally, but I'm saying that when we hear when we talk about um, oppression of black people, and you know we have people say, well, you know, what about the oppression of black women? It's it, you know, look under white male patriarchy, uh, 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 and, and, and white supremacist male patriarchy. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that black women and black men were both systematically denied. Mm -hmm. So that there, there was no advantage. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is there was no gender advantage between black men and black women um, when it came to white male supremacy patriarchy. Right. You know, so, so, and this is how we've been distracted. This is basically how we've been distracted during the 60s and 70s from the white feminist mm -hmm. movement. When we were basically trying to fight for our rights, mm -hmm. then we had white feminists come in and say, well, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's all about um, women oppression. Right. And it's all this. And so what happened was we had these, well, you know, I guess they considered it well-meaning. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about uh, um, uh, um, economic inequalities, the reason why we bring this up, because we have to look at how we suffered from even the so-called solutions. Right. That was supposed to counteract this. Right. You know, what about the white liberal policies? Um, uh, and, and if that sounds harsh, I'm sorry, but, you know, a lot of those policies didn't come from black folks. What I'm saying is, when we start talking about liberal policies as far as addressing this, mm -hmm. we found out that it caused more harm right. than, the, than the benefit. And the reason why is because we all wanted to stay away from the R word, the reparations. Right, right. The, well, the two R words, well, the, the two racism and reparations. and reparations. Right, because so, so then the discussion was always expanded to include everybody but specifically black people. So that, that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult conversation to have. And, and a lot of black people will get kind of pissed off, honestly. Okay, look, this is Coffee Current Events and Politics and Luke Mon Nation. We're not going to cut any cards here. We're not going to pull any punches. Um, when, when black people are talking about our history of oppression in this country and how we are still experiencing inequality that no other group really experiences with the exception of maybe Native Americans. Um, and and we, we have people say, well, you know, what about poor people? You know, what about... Italian immigrants, what about Hispanics, what about white women? We, we get the sense is like, okay, seriously, you don't want to talk about this, do you? But see, this is the thing. None of those issues ever come up when we talk about immigrants. Right. None of those issues ever come up when we talk about other people. And the reason why we have to have this conversation, um, uh, uh, as un uncomfortable as it is, because... First of all, African Americans have been here longer than a lot of the groups that we that we um, advocate for. Right. That's number one. Number right. two is the fact that every time we try to um, um, uh, uh, address these certain issues, we're always distracted by. But what about poor whites? What about right. this? What about that? Not to say that none of those things matter. What I'm saying is there was no talk about um, uh, um, uh, 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 black economic inequality when it came to uh, immigration rights or, mm -hmm. or LGBT rights or mm -hmm. everything else. And what we're saying is, when we talk about um, income, income inequality, what we're saying is, is that everything that we see connected from Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. from all these other things stem a lot of times connected to the root of, 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 of um, income inequality. We can't get around that. Right. And right. we can't sugarcoat it. We can't, there's no other, other nice way to talk, talk about it except that you had a class of people here who were work for free, mm -hmm. did not benefit from, the, from their own labor, and that the inequalities come today because of the lack of generational transferable wealth mm -hmm. that most whites enjoy, 
that blacks were denied, right. and as Christopher and others have reminded us of, that the government even played a role in in still disenfranchising us from economic opportunities that the that the that the country was offering, even during the depression. Right. Right. So. So, you know, it's not, it is not a situation where, uh, you know, black people are saying, oh, well, you know, look, we don't want to talk about um, uh, oppression against women at all. We don't want to talk about sexism at all. No, 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 no. What we are saying, though, is the issue that black people face and the reason we are at the bottom of the economic barrel, we are at the bottom of the, of the political barrel, the reason we are at the bottom of the educational barrel um, is because the system really was designed to keep us specifically right there. Not white women. The system wasn't designed to keep white women disenfranchised. The system wasn't designed to keep uh, 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 poor uh, people necessarily disenfran disenfranchised. The system was absolutely designed to keep people who were not wealthy landowners from amassing the same amount of wealth as wealthy landowners, absolutely. But the system wasn't designed to, to specifically, legally disenfranchise anybody else but black people. And I know that people will say, well, other groups of, of people came here and they were discriminated against. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. At some point during the history of the, the time those groups of people were here, they were allowed to be accepted into the American mythos. They were allowed to be uh, American. The only group of people who have never been allowed to be a part of the American mainstream, a part of the American mythos of what makes America great, is black people. And we have to understand that um, you talked about the racial construct of color mm -hmm. and how even the term white has been used as as sort you know we talk about the race card like it just existed today like but we there, made it up yeah but there was also a race card that was going around where folks determined who was white and who wasn't there right. was a time when Italians were not not looked at as white exactly you know there was a time when Irish weren't looked at as white mm -hmm. but it was that political construct of okay assimilation mm -hmm. you know and, and so when we talk about the race card let's look at the original race card of saying okay. Well, you know, we determined that Italians who we didn't deem white before mm -hmm. are white now. Right. And knowing that just that designation alone mm -hmm. allowed you privileges in this country, which is the reason why so many black people who could pass for white determined to live themselves as white. Exactly. Because that was the advantages that you gained in this country from being from that. being from this made up construct of whiteness and, and blackness or this made up construct of race in this country. So, so um, let me give you one example of, of how, how that mattered um, in, uh, during, the, uh, during the period of time uh, where um, we were settling this country. Let me tell you, let me give you an example to help, to hopefully help people understand why it's important that we don't get distracted from the issue of race when we're talking about the economic plight of black people in this country, not, not that, not that the oppression of women isn't a horrible thing and needs to be addressed. It does. But during the frontier period of this country, right? When there was this, all of this, the American government basically cleared this country of native Americans, slaughtered millions of native Americans, stole their land and claimed all of this land as the, the, the United States as the property of the federal, federal government. And I had talked before about uh, the doctrine of discovery and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the legal cases that were based on, on that ridiculous, um, very racist um, uh, papal bulla that came from the Catholic Church. That's a whole nother live stream. I gotta do that again. But, so during this period of, of homesteading that happened in this country where, where the federal government um, encouraged Americans to go out to all of this unsettled land in the Midwest and in the West uh, to claim it, to, to populate it, basically, after they depopulated all the Native Americans from it. It's amazing, the things that we... So one of the things the federal government did to encourage people to, to do this was 
they told them that they would give them the deed to the land if they could go to, you know, whatever area of land they could find, act, literally pound a wooden stake into the ground and claim that land for themselves. That's Whoever the got there first. Yeah. So so the phrase, we're talking about where phrases come right, from. Right, right. You know the phrase all the time, uh, that you hear all the time, stake a claim for mm -hmm. something. That's where it comes from. The homesteading period. Uh, after we slaughtered, massacred all these Native Americans, the, the, the American government, using the U.S. Army, by the way, um, and told uh, uh, Americans who had the will to travel cross-country and just claim some land, stake a claim to some land, and then the United States government would give them the deed to that land, and they would give them money to help them uh, um, uh, 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 settle the land. They'd give them money to help them build a home. They would give them money to help them farm. They, the, the government would give them like a small loan. Mm -hmm. Or they just give them money altogether. Some of the people who benefited from that policy, the Homestead Act was one of those policies. It was an actual law. Some of the people who benefited from those policies were white women. OK. The only groups of people, there were two groups of people other than people who were not naturalized American citizens, because many of the people who took advantage of the Homestead Act and legislation like it were immigrants. And at that time, there were many immigrants from Germany. The only two groups of people who were excluded from legislation like the Homestead Act were Native Americans and their descendants and black people. So we have this entire mythos, a uh, mythos of how we tame the West, how we won the West, and how so many uh, fortunes were built off of homesteading. Including Trump's. Including Trump's. How, you know, how, how many, how many uh, uh, families can trace their German immigrants uh, uh, and their German immigrant ancestry back to their their families who came here um, and, and and staked claim uh, for land in Wyoming or somewhere like that and 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 we don't think about the people who were excluded from that and we do not connect that to the populations of those areas today in the United States when you think about population density and what people look like who live where. Do you think about a lot of black people living in the Midwest? No, because we weren't allowed to. And I, and I mean, we almost literally, well, not almost literally, we literally were not allowed to. There were, and this wasn't just in the Midwest, this was in several places all over the country, but especially in the Midwest, there were places called sundown towns in in the what what it was like in the forties and the fifties? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I think um, sundown laws or yeah, where, anti the loitering laws, all that. Yeah, kind of where stuff. where but they all you, they all come from the old slave code, right? Where if you were black, you couldn't you you couldn't stay there past sundown. What was the state that that well, Oregon was a state Oregon. that was founded to be a white state? They, yeah, they, they stated that <laughs> you could black people. Oregon didn't want black people in state, period. That was written in the original constitution of the state of Oregon. So, so listen, when we're talking about black people being a class of people, a group of people in the United States who are still on the bottom economically and politically because the system was designed to keep us that way, th that's not hyperbole. We're not we're not just making that up. We're not exaggerating. The system really has always been designed specifically to exclude black people from enjoying the benefits of the expansion and the growth of this country. Now, you said unions. Let me get back to that before I forget, before we end today. Um, like I said, one of our favorite shows is The Wire. It's it's. There, there has, there is nothing like it. There was nothing like it before the wire. There has been nothing like it since. If you, if you want a crash course in, uh, in, 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 in uh, um, everything we talk about, economic injustice, 
um, um, uh, the disappearance of, 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 of the, the, the plight of unions, mm-hmm. um, uh, the plight of the working class, mm-hmm. um, the the um, the, pri- pi- the prison uh, school to prison pipeline. It's everything. Everything connected. If you want a crash course, I would suggest. To watch the five seasons of The Wire. It's it's a hard watch, but it, it's a you, it's a it's a very hard indictment on the American society. Yeah. So so we were talking about this earlier today. Um, we like we really like season two of The Wire, um, and it because season two deals with the ports. All right. So let's let's talk about unions. You're from Camden, New Jersey. Mm. Camden, New Jersey is a big old port town. It used to be huge port town. Because um, you used to build ships there. The yep. U.S. Navy used I to build ships, ships, ships there. Um, uh, ooh, you got to go check on it. <laughs> we're, we're trying to cook dinner and talk to you guys at the same time. Because, you know, domestic married life is great. But, look, we got a revolution, too. But we got to eat. So, so, we were talking earlier today about season two of The Wire. And every time we watch the shows in this series... We see something new that we didn't notice before. And one of the things that I noticed uh, about season two is when I look at the scenes like in the bar um, of, the, of the, the, the union dock workers, the union port workers, the Steve Dorr union members. Uh, when I look at the scenes at the bar, when I look at the scenes in the union hall, when I look at the scenes out on the docks, don't see a lot of black people compared to the white people who are on who are, who are working on the docks and in the union. When you understand history, you know why that is. When you know that unions are incredibly important in the fight for equality for workers' rights, and unions have won us many of the rights that we have today as far as, you know, a five-day work week, uh, an eight-hour work day. You know, your 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 employer can't work you for twelve hours and tell you that if you don't work twelve hours, they're going to fire you. Thank a union that you don't have to work twelve hours anymore. Thank a union that you don't have to work seven days a week anymore. Thank a union that your children uh, can't be conscripted to work for the company you work for. You know, thank a union honestly that women um, uh, uh, can work uh, right alongside men in many jobs. Thank you. Thank unions for that. It is also very true that unions um, were not always fair to black people. So just like everything else in American society, right, um, there was this this fight for workers in general for their rights and for equality and fair wages and, and, and for good jobs. That was, that was true for everybody, everybody. But black people still had to deal with the issue of racism. Because even as uh, unions began to flourish, a lot of those unions didn't want to admit black people. So you have towns like uh, Camden, New Jersey, which when he comes back up here, I'm, I'm going to get him to tell you the story uh, that he told me when we visited uh, Camden that I didn't even know about, which is fascinating. Uh, you have towns like Camden, New Jersey, which are predominantly black now. Some sections are predominantly black now, but they were all white and exclusively white during World War II and for a reason. You have situations like when I'm watching The Wire and I see um, so few black people represented in the union. And I know that through, through the, that historically unions have had a history of racism too. So the benefits that several generations of American workers received from union membership Many black people couldn't receive those benefits, even though they worked the same jobs as white union members, they couldn't get the benefit of the higher wages and the the health benefits and the education benefits because the unions didn't always admit those black workers. So when, when you talk about uh, the idea that if you just focus on on economic equality um, and then that's going to fix 
all of these other issues in American society, that might work in other countries. But I know the history of this country, and I know that's not true. And I don't know what he's doing downstairs. I think he's cooking something else up. So I'm going to tell you the story that he told me about Camden, New Jersey. So there's a, a, a neighborhood in Camden that my uh, sister-in-law lives in now. It's called White Fairview. They actually call it White Fairview. And the U.S. Navy built the neighborhood for the, the members of the Steve Dorr Union, for the people who worked on the docks building the ships. I'm not sure if that's the Steve Dorr Union or not. I probably got that wrong. But anyway, for the union members who worked on the docks building Navy ships, the Navy built this neighborhood. And the neighborhood was segregated. Black people could not live in the neighborhood. Even if black people worked on the dock in Camden building ships right alongside those white people building the ships, they couldn't live in that neighborhood that the U.S. Navy built, White Fairview. So you tell me when the system creates that kind of inequality where certain workers are, are, are able to receive benefits that are provided by the United States government that other workers are denied solely because of their designation under this made-up social construct called race. How in the world do those two groups of people have an equal shot at opportunity in this country. They don't because it was designed that they wouldn't. And he, t he told me this story because uh, we, were, we, we were driving through trying to get to his sister-in-law's house and he always gets lost because he always takes the wrong turn because all the houses look the same. They look exactly the same. And they all look exactly the same because it was literally a U.S. Navy company town. That's how they built it. And, and I asked him, why do the houses all look the same? And he told me the story. The Navy built the houses. You know, they built this community. And, and, you know, you know this place used to be all white. I'm like, what are you talking about? This area used to be all white? He's like, yeah, that's why we call it White Fairview. Because, you know, during World War II and, and for several years after, black people couldn't live here. So, so people hear that type of, of history that, that happened in this country very, very recently, and, and they still have this idea that we are an equal society. And I don't know how you could think that when you also know that the U.S. Navy and the U.S. government didn't build comparable housing for black workers. They didn't. Black people have pretty much had to fend for themselves. And because of the nature of racism in this country, because of, of the way black people have been categorized and, and because of the way Americans have been conditioned to see black people, black people were always preyed upon. Always preyed upon. So we ended up renting houses for exorbitant amounts of money for people who ripped us off because they knew we didn't have a choice. Because they knew we couldn't live in White Fairview. If you think that only happened in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, we live right now in Southeast D.C. And there is a, a very nice um, uh, apartment complex. Big, big apartment complex development. Um, like three, yeah, three, four blocks up the street from where we live. We live in Southeast D.C., predominantly black neighborhood. Washington, D.C. was also a Navy port town. We actually have a Navy yard here. Um, and there's, there's a battleship parked out there too. That's, that's a tourist attraction now. It's a little museum. This, uh, uh apartment complex, like four blocks up the street from us, uh, is called Mayfair Gardens. And I didn't know until about 10, 15 years ago that it was also all white. Black people. Now, now if you understand the demographics of Washington, D.C., you understand that the D.C. has been called Chocolate City for a long time for a reason, because it was predominantly black for a very long time. Um, so imagine 
having a a a a a a, a, a huge apartment complex in in a city that is predominantly black that only white people could live in. And you wonder, how did that happen? Well, it happened because at one time, Washington, D.C. was just as racially segregated as everywhere else in this country. And by federal law, black people couldn't live in Mayfair Gardens. As a matter of fact, by federal law, black people couldn't live in Southeast D.C. at all. And there was one, there was a time in this country, uh, uh, in this city's history, where the, demographic, where the demographics of Washington, D.C. flipped. Where most of the black people lived in Northwest and Southwest, and most of the white people lived in Southeast and Northeast. Uh, that can be seen uh, by... In Georgetown, which is very, very predominantly white, very affluent area of Washington, D.C., one of the oldest black churches in the city still exists. And you've got a lot of older black people who still go to that church. But black people can't afford to live in Georgetown. Heck, most white people can't afford to live in Georgetown. Let's be real. <laughs> Georgetown is ridiculously expensive. And right over here in Temple Hills, Maryland, you told me that Temple Hills itself is named after the fact that there was a Jewish temple in that area. Why so there's a large Jewish cemetery. There is a large Jew. There is no large Jewish population that lives in this area of the city anymore. But, but, but one of the things I wanted to get to because we only got a few minutes left. I know. Is um, we started off asking the, the point of the live stream is why the rising tide doesn't lift all boats. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it doesn't lift all boats is because, first of all, we're not dealing with the reasons, the causes of why um, there's uh, income inequality um, uh, uh, in relations to the black community. Mm -hmm. Like we're not like we're not being honest right. about why. Um, uh, black people are disproportionately poor mm -hmm. than other Americans. Mm -hmm. Why that black people have a harder time? Why is it that during the, the housing crisis of, of 08, uh, why is it that black people lost uh, most of their wealth through uh, foreclosures? Black people were foreclosed upon more than anybody else in this country. Mm -hmm. Why the black community mm -hmm. still hasn't recovered from, um, uh, from the recession of um, um, 08? Right. Why is it that we had a black president who oversaw the largest transference of wealth to the one percent, top one percent? Um, talking about President Obama, mm -hmm. who oversaw the biggest transfer of wealth to the top one percent than any president before him. Right, right. And that why black people who are at the bottom of that, why aren't we tearing this country apart be, uh, uh, because of that? But the only thing that we can say is is that Obama had swag. Well, um, you know, Michelle he had Obama, a scandal-free presidency. Ma Ma Michelle Obama, uh, you know, she. Um, you know, she looked good in her dress, or the kids were manly. You know, so we're we're thrown as the black community, and we're going to talk about this um, uh, in, in a little more depth in, in part two. Mm -hmm. But as, in, but see, what we're trying to tell our allies, our white liberal friends, and, mm -hmm. and others who are our allies in the struggle, is that until we address this um, uh, uh, this wealth gap, mm -hmm. until we address the wealth gap. Um, we're going all the other systemic problems that come from that mm -hmm. is going to always exist. Right. And until right. we at, until we get on board and realize that we have to close this wealth gap, then we're going to see more of these problems. And the fact that we in the black community has always been thrown symbolism. Right. But we've right. never been thrown. A pre, like you, you mentioned Jackie when you first started. Mm -hmm. You said about uh, Barack Obama and. The fact that, um, you know, we had Barack Obama for eight years. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the eight years that we had the first black president, Bill Clinton. <laughs> the first so-called Yeah, the first so-called black. Barack was the second. <laughs> according yeah, according yeah. to some of us, right, Barack right. wasn't the first. He yeah, so didn't... so even under the so-called golden years of the Clintons. Right. We didn't do, we didn't do any better. Right. You know, so, so we have to be honest why these things exist in the first place. Oh, right. Okay, the Razzie... No, we're not mad at you. <laughs> when we, listen, and, and people who have been watching my live streams for some time on another outlet and watching us here at, at, at Coffee Current Events and Politics and Luke Mon Nation, well, we, we really need to tell you all this. We, I guess this is the disclaimer that we should always start off with, I suppose. Um, these are hard conversations to have. They're hard. 
they are not going to be pleasant. None of them. <laughs> we're, at some point, we're going to piss somebody off. We are. We know we are. Because because the truth of history um, absolutely challenges everything we believe about this country. We know that. We And, and that's very frightening for people to have their... Um, their ideology challenge, and and that's okay. We don't. We're not going to agree on every single thing, and that is okay too. What we aim to do is have the conversation, tell the truth, talk about the history and the facts. We're not going to be mad at anybody. You can have the opinion that you have based on whatever it is you believe. That's cool. We can have a conversation about that, but. But what we what we will never do at Coffee Current Events and Politics, we will never disrespect you. No, and, no. And we won't get into name calling. No. Nah. We won't get into disrespecting our audience because mm -mm. we appreciate you. You don't have to be. You don't have to agree with us, as Jackie said. But I'm not mad at you, Razzie. We I'm love just, you. I was, we thank you for I, joining I us. I'm very passionate about it. But I, I will say this: we have to be grown ups about this. Come on. And man. we have to be grown ups <laughs> about if we're going to push our society in a more progressive way, mm -hmm. then, you know, this ain't for punks. This, uh, and, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, let me make a disclaimer. I'm not saying anybody's a punk. What I'm saying is, is that we, you know, this, you know, we're, we're not on, you know, we're not on the wheezy liberal side here. You no, know, we no. really got to really tackle this and push this society forward. And we all have to develop a tougher skin. We do. And, and, and listen, um, we, when we're talking about tackling the, the true roots of the inequality we face, um, we're not saying that we're not going to tackle other issues that we all face too because during those conversations, yeah, those issues do come up. Absolutely. But look, we can't deal with the reason the idea of a rising tide lifts all boats is bullshit for black people. And oh, by the way, I'm going to curse every once in a while. So if that bothers you, I don't know what to say. Um, it, it, we, we can't deal with that without dealing with the issues of why this idea that, that look, if education is, is, is the key, is our ticket out, why is it that even black people with college degrees are twice as likely to be unemployed as white people with the same it level of education? It hasn't closed the wealth gap. It hasn't closed the wealth gap, right? If, if we, we're not going to deal with this issue about why this rising tide hasn't lift our boats, if we're not going to talk about, um, uh, uh, well, uh, if, if, if affirmative action is the answer and black women have, have benefited from affirmative action too, then why is it that the black women who have benefited from affirmative action still make less money than white women? And let's talk about why is it that black women who are the most educated class that, that, in this thank country... Thank you, thank you. Black women who are the most educated in this country, black women have the most... Black American women mm -hmm. have the most college degrees in America, <laughs> yet they are worth, worth minus $11,000. So why is that? If, right. if you have a class of people, American black women, mm -hmm. who um, uh, you never hear the you know, never hear the feminist movement touting that statistic, but what I'm saying is that uh, black American women are the most educated in this country, have the most college degrees, right? Yet they are worth minus eleven thousand dollars, and this is what the data shows, right? So so no, you know we're we're not going to be mad at anybody. We can disagree. We can agree to disagree. We're going to have some passionate discussions on this topic and a whole bunch of other ones. But we're going to continue this conversation uh, next week. Um, thank you very much for tuning in, you all. Uh, we're going to go have our dinner, our delicious duck dinner that my hubby fixed. I'm so happy, so excited. And, and we hope you guys spend some time with your families. Enjoy Sunday. Enjoy your family day. Go to our Facebook page. Well, you're already on our Facebook page. That's kind of silly. But like our Facebook page. And, and share the video. Share the video. Please share the video. Um, go to our YouTube channel. Like our YouTube channel. Luke and subscribe. Nation, Luke Mon Nation on YouTube. Yep. Check us out on Twitter. Luke Mon Nation 1, the number 1 on Twitter. Uh, on the Twitter. And, and stay tuned uh, for our continuation of this discussion and some other stuff uh, during the week and next Sunday. Here on Loop My Nation, Coffee Current Events and Politics in Loop My Nation. Thank you for joining us. This is Jacqueline Loop Mon. And at the Shahi Loop Mon. Signing off, thanking you very much. Have a great week. Peace. Boo.